Let's turn to a portion of scripture from Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll read from verses 9 to 13, Hebrews chapter 2. And read from verses 9 to 13. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. One second. Yeah. Glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him from whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I declare the name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. May God bless the reading of scripture and the spirit. Teach us the truth as we go through this. <coughs> Last time, we discussed how Jesus is greater than the angels, and we're still continuing the same topic, how Jesus is greater than the angels. And this is a difficult passage for certain verses or certain words that have been used inside. If you are very carefully going to see those verses, you might land up into problems. But if you, if you, and if you forget the context of the passage and you do not study it the way scripture has to be studied, you might actually land up into a lot of cultic ideas. Now, I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're going to see in this portion. For example, when you start here, God announces something to us, which is the greatest hope that we have, that God will bring his people to glory. God will bring his people to glory through the work of the leader, Jesus Christ. That's the passage about. God is going to bring his people to glory to the work of that leader, Jesus Christ. And the beauty of the passage is, see, there are people who, who will end up taking up this portion of scripture and telling you that, you know, you look at this portion, this portion shows us that Jesus is a created being. For example, when you read chapter 9, or verse 9 of chapter 2, you'll see something like this. And we spoke about this last time. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. And we had spent some time understanding from the Hebrew uh, what the word the angels is and we understood how it has to be interpreted. But if someone reads it, that Jesus was made and stops there and they'll say, see, this means that Jesus was created by God. But unless he reads the entire portion of scripture, understand that's not what the context means. The context means Jesus was made lower than the angels in meaning of authority. Right? If you just land up reading parts of the scripture and stopping there, you'd land up into problems. But the beauty of this passage is even if someone tells you that, see, here it means that Jesus is a created being, so he cannot be equal to God, you just make him read verse 10. Look at verse 10. Though we come to it slowly. For it became him from whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Did you read that? From whom are all things and by whom are all things. What is that reference to? To? To creation. By whom are all things and to whom are all things. Meaning, who created the world? God. Who made this? And this is ascribed to whom? Jesus. So if someone says Jesus is a created being in verse 9, it cannot be because verse 10 very clearly in words explaining that Jesus is 
is God. And I've said this before. Every time, if you have a doubt about Jesus being God, the best book to turn to after the Gospel of John is the book of Hebrews. Because in so many ways, it explains to us that Jesus is God. He's someone under whom everything is going to be, everything that exists is because of him. Then the passage goes on to show us something extremely beautiful, something that the Jewish mind could never understand. In the morning, we read Psalm 22. Obviously, if you have read this portion carefully, you'll understand why I read Psalm 22 in the morning. Because verse, chapter, verse 12 is directly taken from Psalm 22. Verse 13 is taken from the book of Isaiah. Now, for a Jew, even though they would read Psalm 110 or Psalm 22, they would never understand and never fully gather that their Savior can die. They can never understand that the Savior will show sign of weakness. They can never understand that that Savior will be judged by the ruler of this earth. Because for them, their Messiah was supposed to give them victory and defeat all the kings of the world. Now here again, the writer of Hebrews is now continuing his comparison of Jesus with the angels. Now the comparison is very different. Till now the comparison was what the angels did, right? Angels did judgment when the Ten Commandments were given. And then we say, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Because if angels did judgment, imagine how much more judgment will be done by, by Jesus. But now we come to something which is something much more that we understand in what we believe about Christ, what he does to our lives. This is about Jesus suffering. This is about how he suffered and he dies physically because angels cannot die. You understand this? We, we discussed this when we studied. We said all rational beings are eternal beings. For example, angels are eternal. Man is eternal. When the Bible talks about second death, the second death will be in hell where he will understand what is happening to him. Right? We are not going to go completely annihilated from the world and we cease to exist. When the world speaks about annihilation, they think that death is the final end of man. And we keep telling them, death is not the final end of man. Final end is when the Lord Jesus will come and will judge each person his sin to for finally that person to be with him in heaven for eternity or be in hell for eternity suffering. So now we have this beautiful comparison, but let's see the context of the verse, verse by verse, and we see some very beautiful things. Let's start with verse 9, which says, But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. Now that's, uh, that's if, I, if I just stop for a moment and go to my pet subject of how we can never learn things from experience. This is one of the best verses. But we see Jesus. We spoke last time from the same chapter. We said the writer of Hebrews in all probability did not see Jesus. Right? Remember we studied verse 4. Oh, sorry, verse 3. It says, how shall we escape with neglect so great a salvation? Which had the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So the writer of Hebrews himself did not see Jesus. But here's what he's saying. But we see Jesus. Now this is something that we need to understand. Experience cannot give us truth. You need to understand this very strongly. No experience can give you truth. Even more, no experience can give you understanding of biblical doctrine. There is no way you can experience Christ dying on the cross. You understand this? There is no way by experience you will understand what we, we study in this passage. The substitutionary atonement that Christ died for 
us. Even if someone shows you the cross physically and someone shows you people dying on the cross, in no way you will understand that Christ died for me on the cross. You understand this, what I'm saying? Experience cannot teach you doctrine. You need to remember this because most of the time, and particularly here, you'll hear uh, uh, charismatics uh, speak about this, that they have experienced it. And since they have experienced it, it has to be true. You need to understand experience cannot give you any form of truth. Again, by looking at the cross, you can never understand the substitutionary atonement. Because Christ was not the first person to be killed on the cross. I hope you understand that. Even when he was killed, there were two more people who, who were kept next to him. So even when you see the cross, you cannot understand that this means substitutionary atonement. Death on the cross was a humiliating death, which was always done by the Romans. No matter how many times I show someone a movie about Jesus dying, does not help him understand that Jesus died for the sins of the church. He cannot understand that. So when we read in the scriptures, when we see Jesus, what would that mean? We know. We understand. We believe. So when we believe, so now look at that verse. It makes, so now we see Jesus. We believe Jesus. What do we believe about him? He was made a little, right? So again, you will not see Jesus being made lower than the angels. No one saw that. But now we believe, what do we believe? That Jesus was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's what angels could not do. Jesus became our substitute. Angels cannot die. And I want you to want to tell you this. This is a doctrine that is attacked by hardcore reform people also. If you ever heard of someone by the name of N.T. Wright, he is a prolific author, um, uh, a very good writer. I mean, people who have read his works would say N.T. Wright can never de deny substitution atonement. He put substitu uh, substitution atonement as something which is not important. There are reformed churches today who deny the whole idea and they say this is fiction. Christ died as a good example for us. He did not die for on our behalf. But there are so many verses in scriptures, time and again, which constantly tell you, turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. And we read this, verse 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth a son, born of woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law. He might redeem those who were under the law. I'm not going to go through the entire bunch of verses that explain substitutionary atonement. One of the other verses that if you remember, Ephesians 5, which says husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The idea of substitutionary atonement is complete in scriptures right from the Old Testament when a, when an animal was sacrificed. But today, people would want to dilute that truth even among churches. I'm, I'm telling you, these are problems in the reformed churches. The reason I'm saying this is, do not have a habit of taking things for granted that when people tell you things. When people tell you from the aspect of a Christian, it's good to check what they mean because people change the meaning of words that they use. They constantly do. And that's a classic example that heretics do. They want to change what is our only hope that Christ died in place of us because angels could not die. Even if angels were superior to Christ when Christ was on the earth, in terms of the position that he was as a man, angels could not save us. Angels could not die instead of us. If you have been following what we, were, what we did um, a couple of weeks back when we studied the person of Christ, the composition of Christ's humanity and divinity, the first thing we said was, 
Christ had completely to be a man. And he also completely had to be God. Otherwise, there was no hope for us to be saved. Only then he could be a substitution for us, being completely man. So Jesus died for us. And this is something that the Jewish mind or Israel could never ever understand. Even today, the biggest problem of the Hebrew, the Hebrew people when they read about Jesus is that he cannot be the savior because he died. He cannot be the savior because he's shown sign of weakness. He cannot be a savior because he was humiliated. Now was Christ humiliated? Yes. What was his first humiliation? What was his first humiliation? No, that came 33 years later. He was born. That's the first humiliation. The person who created everything is now become a part of that creation. The person under whom everything bows down is someone who has to be subject to the rules of the nation. The person who created Caesar has now to pay taxes to Caesar. The person who decided what will happen to Herod is now has to take his life decision from this person. That's where it started. Being born was a humiliation from that point of time. And you need to understand that. And every aspect of his life only showed humiliation. His birth, the running away in his birth, that he had to be protected by earthly parents. All of that was humiliation just because of us. In every aspect that he came, he, he did, he worked, he ran. And if you follow that, you'll understand how Israel's history, it's a, it's a beautiful Bible study on its own to see how we can compare the life of Jesus to what was happening with Israel. Everything that Jesus did right from running, did he go to Egypt? Remember that? Right from his going to Egypt and coming out of Egypt had a symbolic reference. God, who created the entire universe, could have made him being born not to this Mary, or he could have made this Mary marry one of the richest people in, in, in Jerusalem. But he did not do that. He made him a Nazarite because he wanted him to look and speak the way he did. He went, he was made to be in a place where it was common knowledge that nothing good can come out of that place. In each of his life, he was only humiliated, not for his sake, but for yours and my sake. It was done because the extent of his humiliation should be complete. Look at that text. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Just a small two points that I need to explain there. There are people who will tell you that, see, Jesus here only tasted death. He actually did not die. I mean, someone who has read the whole of scripture and looks at this verse and says, Jesus tasted death and he did not die. I mean, you have got madmen everywhere, as I say. Uh, you have got the Islamis who take up this passage and say, see, your Bible tells Jesus only tasted death. I said, you pick up a verse from a chapter, from a book which only speaks about him dying continuously. There's not a single passage in this entire book of Hebrews that does not talk about him dying. That portion is about death. But why is that word tasted being used? Because for a very important reason. Angels cannot taste. Tasting is what? An attribute of what? Body. So Jesus had what? A body that we always keep understanding and saying, Jesus had a body, an actual physical body, like each one of us, only difference being it had no sin. That's all. So Jesus 
could taste. And the Bible says he tasted death. Now here's one more difficult portion. He tasted death for every man. You will have the Armenians telling you, see, this portion of the Bible shows you that Jesus died for all people, right? Now, first and foremost, if you read the next verse, you will not even bother about that. What does the next verse says? Okay, let's read verses 9 and 10. That by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory. What was the purpose of his death? To bring many sons to glory. We'll speak about that many sons also because that again becomes a difficult uh, interpretation. right? But the purpose of his dying was to bring sons to glory. If everyone, if he's died for everyone, it would mean that everyone should come to glory. Or if it died for everyone and everyone did not come to glory, then the failure is on whose part? Christ's part. Because he did something and did not achieve the purpose for which he died. But if you look at the context, it's very easy. Okay, now also remember, this does not mean, as many people say, that his death was sufficient for everyone, but efficient only for, for the elect. Right? Christ's death was sufficient for all people in the world, there is no denying if there were three times more people in the world and if Christ had to pay the price for all of them, it could have been done by what death he did on the cross. But that does not mean what he died for was applicable to them even in one bit. If you look at the context, the context is very clear. We're talking about all kinds of men because he's speaking about Christ. Under Christ, everyone will be subject to Christ. So when I say everyone will be subject to Christ, what do I mean? Right from the lowest to the highest, right from the slaves to the king, everyone is subject to Christ in that manner. And you have a very similar verse in 1 Timothy. Remember 1 Timothy? He says, pray for all men. Christ died for all men. And if you look at the context again, it speaks about right from kings to servants to slaves, to masters, and it says pray for all men. So in this context, it is clear that Christ tasted death for every type of man. No matter if he's a king or if he's a slave, he's a man or a woman, Christ tasted death for every type of man. For what reason? Look at the reason. Verse 10. That's the motive of his suffering. His suffering was that God, because of him, should give grace to the people. Because of him, because he is given glory and honor, man will get glory and honor because of Christ. That's the motive. That's the result. The greatest thing that you and I can ever think is God dying for us. Now, this is something very important. And the last couple of days, I've been discussing with some, someone about Lent. Uh, pardon me that I'm going a little away from the topic, but uh, there's a lot of talk, again, among the reform circles, that shouldn't a Christian also celebrate the, day of, the days of Lent? And it has happened a lot of reform churches are going the Roman Catholic way, and they are trying to celebrate the days of Lent. So you will find even reform people saying that we need to celebrate something like the Ash Wednesday, uh, uh, there are people who are here from the Roman Catholic background who can help us more. Um, I'm, I came from the Martuma Church where we were somewhere halfway through joining the Roman Catholic Church. Now we have gone that side also. Now, just think about this. Should a Christian remember Lent or keep Lent? Okay, let, let me make it more difficult for you. The early church celebrated Easter. Okay, I mean, not the, uh, we, are, we do not know about the apostles themselves, but the early church, after the apostles celebrated Easter. They even celebrated Christmas. So they celebrated Easter. So should, should we also celebrate Easter? No. 
do we remember the death of Christ? When? Every time of our life and particularly every Sunday as a church. Do you remember the death of Christ? Sadly. Yes or no? Joyfully. Joyfully. You remember the death of Christ joyfully, not sadly, because the Lord never told us to cry for him. Rather, he said, cry for whom? Yourself and your children. The crying should not be that my Savior is dying. The crying should be, I am the reason for which the Savior died. So when a Christian thinks he can put ash on his forehead and behave that he is becoming, showing the death of Christ, he's actually doing a disservice. People always ask him, Simon, why do you have such rigid views about this? Bible tells us to have freedom in the way we want to have our religion. He said, perfect freedom. But if you want to show sorrow, it has to be in the closet. If you want to be prayerful, about death of Christ, it has to be in the inner room. You remember this? When Christ tells you, if you're fasting, what should you do? No, no, before that. If you're fasting, what you, what you should do? Put oil on your face. I, I, I do not think we know, understand what that means. What do you mean? Like, it's a struggle for us to put oil on Jairus' face. It's a... It's a perfume and remember that oil on whose beard? Aaron's beard. What does that mean? Aaron was a sticky man. It was a sign of joy. Meaning when I'm having sorrow in the closet about my sin, when I'm outside, I will be what? Joyous. Joyous. So if I still want to continue praying on the days of Lent, Focusing my idea on the cross, on, on the cross and the death that was done by Christ, it would be in the closet in sorrow for my sins, not because Christ was crucified, but Christ was crucified for me. My sorrow will not be for Christ because he never asked that. We can't do that. Also, look at the Indian culture. If we're going to be applying ash on a forehead and roaming around, how will you differentiate between you and a Hindu Baba outside? Because do exactly the same. When you are supposed to be separate from the world, you're going to be behaving in every manner like the world itself. Because, but the Bible does not ask you to do that. The reason Christ died, the reason Christ was humiliated, not that we feel sad for him, but that we, in the grace of God, will get glory and honor which God gave to his son. And because of him, we got it. Verse 10. For it became him from whom are all things and by whom are all things. Because again, the writer of Hebrews has to show us that even though he suffered, he is still God. Even though he died and angels cannot die, this man who suffered is the man who created everything in this universe. But what is he doing? He suffered because of this. This is the reason he was humiliated in bringing many sons unto glory. You can add daughters there also. Many sons and daughters unto glory. Now again, let's see how people interpret this verse badly. So many people say, see, Christ has died so that many sons will come to glory. He is, that means all sons do not come to so there could be possibility that someone can be a son and later loses salvation. Does that verse speak about that? What is the verse about? Whom are we talking about? Remember, Hebrew is written in a form of a text which can be read as poetry at times. So you'll see the text. You're talking about the sun and that sun is going to take many sons into glory. Every time you read the scriptures, you'll understand that when we speak about salvation, we speak about what was the promise given to Abraham? Your children would be like stars in the sky and so the number would be small or big. Big. The idea that the writer of Hebrews is trying to give us, it's not going to be like one or two. There are going to be many 
a big number which we again and again see in the bible we speak about a large number of people will come to glory let's look at that text again for it became him from all things by whom all things are made in bringing a large group of people unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings again a difficult text jesus became what a captain of their salvation some uh, text would say jesus became the author of their salvation i'm not sure which uh, esv you know the esv you have a founder of your that is esv okay esv speaks about founder now the text can be understood in two senses right both senses can be right one sense is jesus is a leader of salvation right for example was moses a leader yes did he pray for them did he lead them from captivity into freedom yes and what the lord did is is exactly like that it took us from captivity into freedom so that way jesus uh, the english equivalent of the word would be pioneer so pioneer could both mean a leader as well as so the pioneer could also mean a leader so one is clear jesus is a leader who took them from captivity brought them into freedom the second example is the word founder jesus rightfully founded the christian religion rightfully founded or put the foundation for faith and we have this everywhere that jesus himself is the foundation he himself is the foundation and we see this all across the old testament that god led his people and we see that again in the book of uh, hebrews as we go on there is speak about abraham we speak about moses and how jesus is greater than abraham and moses and melchizedek he himself is the leader but we go to a much more difficult portion the next verse he make the captain of the salvation perfect through sufferings so jesus became perfect through sufferings i said if you do not understand this verse carefully you can land up into becoming a cult so there are people who take up this verse and say see here jesus was not perfect he kept obeying god and when he kept obeying god and obeying god finally he became perfect that's heresy he was born perfect as a man perfect as god he is always perfect as god and we have studied this before as god and as man he could not sin so there is nothing jesus could do which was not perfect in no way you can ever think that he become perfect now the way to understand the word perfect is easy if you just understand the word would mean complete right you can just look at that and i'll read this verse for you to make him the captain of their salvation complete through suffering what was jesus supposed to do for us why did he come to the earth why did he come to the earth who had told him to go god the father god the father told him to go what did he do did he obey or he did not he obeyed so he was given a job right a vocation what was the vocation to save all that that was given to him that was the job that was given to him did he finish it perfectly yes and so you can read in the high priestly prayer also when he says i have not lost a single person that you have given to me he did that job perfectly in all completion so when you read that text you should understand that jesus was the captain of their salvation who was made perfect through all that he suffered his work that he did was perfected in each of his suffering that means whatever christ did for us from the time that he was born to the time he went on the cross all the suffering that he was done was to perfect the act for which he actually had come to the earth to die for man 
not a single event in all of that you can remove not a single event in all of that you can say would not be required as we said a couple of sundays before that if someone does not believe in that jesus had to be born of a virgin we said that person is not a christian because a virgin birth is essential to the idea of how we are saved because only then he can be completely a man without sin so this jesus became perfect and let's read verse 11 let's see the blessing that this jesus is. he is a sanctifier verse 11 for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren we always understand that jesus died for us and he caused us to be accepted in the lord and then would people say that's where the work is ended now since jesus died for us the rest of the work would be done by man now the gates to go to heaven are open now from here we should do our work and if we do not do our work if we do not participate in sanctification we cannot be saved what does the text say who sanctifies us god and jesus for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren i want you to focus on the wonders that christ has done for us not only did he die for us but today he is standing as a intercessor before god and the text says he is not ashamed of calling us brethren there are so many times in our life when we would be ashamed to think of ourselves as christians when we know when we look into our own closet and we understand that we are far from what we should be it may not be open sins it may not be closet sins there would be times of fear and we do not really rely on god for all things we might actually behave like the world outside who do not have hope there would be times of despair when we think ourselves as no, nothing different than the rest of the world when our aspirations our choices would become like the world there would be times when we can rightly say we are ashamed of what we have become but even at that time look at what the text says jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren the people who are being sanctified meaning when i go through the worst experience of my life the thing to turn to is not a nine point of coming back to god or brother do these things and all of a sudden your life will become better brother you should do these steps and your life will see a change the first thing to see is the person who sanctifies me is christ any other way of achieving sanctification will only lead you to despair if you read about martin luther that would be enough for us to give us goosebump of what this man had to do thinking that he has to get salvation so much so that most people say martin died early because he had already subjected his body to so much of hardships just because he thought by making him go through these hardships he would attain salvation but we need to remember the only way we can attain salvation is turn our eyes to that person who sanctifies us and then he will open that things for us then that shame that we face will be glory when we turn ourselves into our closet and our times of prayers when the disease and the pain that i have i'll understand that's a joy that god has given to me so that i don't gloat over what i've achieved in life and forget him when every trouble that i face through i understand this trouble is given by god to me but i can get tested and be refined and turn back to him and saying let god be praised in all things he is our sanctifier and he has done that so that he is not ashamed 
to call these brothers and sisters whom he has brought to God as his brethren. He calls us his brothers. That's beautiful. And that's always been an idea right from the time Jesus has been on the earth that for the people whom he died for, he calls them as brothers and sisters and friends. And he says his greatest desire is to work for them. Let's look at that verse. For both he that sanctified, verse 11, and those who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I'll declare the name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. He takes the verses from, as I said, Psalm 22, which is a psalm that starts with the insult of the Savior. The psalm that starts by David crying, God, why have you forsaken me? And the psalm, and when the writer of Hebrews picks it up, he says, see, not only the death on the cross achieved your justification, the death on the cross also achieved your sanctification. That even now, after he has died, we have not seen him, we have heard him. Then he's talk about that we believe in what he has done and we believe that he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. In, 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 in the Roman period and in Hebrews, if someone is not according to the standards of the world or standards that they have, the very easy thing was to despise the person and throw him out. You would know stoning a person in public was common. And now to a people, Hebrews, a very important thing is shown that even with your sin, even with what is happening in your life daily, this God does not condemn you. He will. Look at verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has, I'll put my trust in God. Uh, just a small thing for uh, not the focus of the study, but if you notice, uh, the dispensations will tell you that there was no church in the Old Testament. Church is only in the New Testament. But if you look at verse 12, what does it say? Church. And it's a verse taken from the Old Testament because church is a word, ecclesia, which is used in the Greek as that. In the Old Testament, you'll find the word gathering or a congregation. It's the same idea, a collection of people. So here he's saying, among the church, among the brethren, Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren. What do we understand from this? Let's sum it up. Jesus, born of a woman, learned obedience so that he could complete all that which was given to him. He was complete the task that was given to him. And since he finished that task, as Brother Samir showed that in Psalm 110, what is he doing is? He is sitting at the right hand because the task which was given to him has been completed in perfect obedience. So that we can say, yes, that is the leader, that is the founder of the church. What we need to see is our lives as we share the righteousness that God has given us should not land up in any way insulting what God has given to us. Christ is still saying he's not ashamed to call us brethren. But what about our own lives? What about our own cares? Will we create places when we think that Christ is going to be ashamed of what I'm doing. Or is it that Christ can say, this is my brethren, this is my brother, this is my sister, and they are acting wisely. Our greatest hope is that we submit ourselves to God with the perfect example who's there in front of us, that is Christ. He submitted to God in every bit, starting with his humiliation. And that's a lesson that we need to understand. Angels will not understand this. Only we can. 
So if you in your life are facing humiliation, are facing trouble, facing pain, you have a perfect example in front of you who went through all of that, who went through each bit of that so that we can stand in front of God perfectly sanctified. All of us do not go through the same trouble. We have different troubles. That doesn't mean any of our troubles are lesser than the other person's troubles. Every person's trouble would be unique. But not a single trouble is such that we can even for once think that we are out of God's will. Samir always says this, and even today he said this when he started, that when we pray, let's not only pray for things that has God has done, good things that God has done to us. When we pray, even think about the bad things that have happened to us because the person who gave it to us is God, no one else. It may have come through so many other secondary means, that's fine. But the trouble that has come to us is someone that God has kept there for us to learn. It could be a bad boss. It could be a bad job. It could be a bad husband or a wife. It could be a bad spouse or children. But God has put us there and God has given us and made us go through that because he wants us to see the humiliation that Christ went through and depend on him because he is sanctifying us and making us go through all of this. I said before, do not think you are greater than the master, that when he gets humiliated, we will not be. And for us, the greatest joy would be to suffer that as a Christian. Let's read that verse and then we'll stop. Verse 13. And again, and I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, I'll put my trust in him. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Precious Master, when we think about the humiliation, when we see Jesus humiliated for us, when we see his death on the cross, when we see his suffering, help us, Lord, to understand why it was required. It was our sins that made your child suffer. It was our sins that made him take up the cross. So when we see our salvation, O oh God, when we see our justification, help us to see why your son did that we could be holy. We would be righteous. Not our own, not our own doing, not what our own hands have done, but your sons. But forgive us, Lord, that our lives every day forgets what we have bought. What is the reason we have been bought for? When we forget our times of prayers to thank you, when we forget our times of prayers to pray for our beloved brethren. Help us Lord to remember that your son, even today, is our intercessor. Even today, with our sins, with our actions, with our thoughts, we're sure he's not going to throw us away. He's not going to be ashamed to call us brethren. Make us ashamed of our sins of God. And as we run from our own sins, help us, Lord, to run to you. Because only in you will we find salvation. Help us, O oh Master, that let sin not be our friend, but help us to see sin as our greatest enemy. Help us to work hard, O Master. 
Let that laziness be our greatest enemy when we know sin is entering into our minds and our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be diligent in studying your word, in praying for the church, in doing what our Lord is doing for us, praying for the brethren. Help us, Lord, that in every moment of humiliation, we remember our Lord, who for the work set before him, did all of this because he knew what was asked of him. And he knew what would be the end of it. And as he's finished it perfectly, he's sitting at your right hand. Help us, Master, to look at him as our sanctifier, as our leader, as our pioneer. As we break bread, O oh God, let that sin that so easily entangles will be able to recognize. And at your throne, we can say, O oh Lord, we are sinful. But in your Son, forgive us and restore to us the joy of salvation. In your Son's name, we offer this prayer. Amen.